course. Course. <laughs> I'm shook. I'm shook. I might have to put this in, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's leave this in. Let's leave this in. Okay. Oh, boy. Really, really hard, and they execute the system, and that's what it's all about. Oh, God. Yes, sir. Trust. Big trust. Big trust. Big trust. Hey, yes, sir. <laughs> right on cue. Hey, right on cue. Hey, I, let me go. We're back on the jumbo set. It is Wednesday, my dudes, October 4th, 10 4. Roger that, 10 4, 2023. My name is Jake Luke, and this is officially take two of, uh, at the very least, this portion of the episode. Joining me for the second time now after we got about five minutes deep and realized the video was not going. And then if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, you probably just saw that I beefed up the, uh, the intros there. So I'm just, I'm all sorts of off my platform right now. How's it going, pal? It's going well. We uh, we went a couple in. It happens. We're 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 cracking up. We've been laughing, uh, but we're back. We're good to go. We're fired up. I got some golf in earlier. Feeling good. Got some sun. The Ravens win twenty eight to three. We settle up with the settlement at the end of this episode. Jack makes a great point. The Ravens have an opportunity to go three and zero on the road in the division, like weeks from Halloween. The division makers are crazy. Like the schedule makers are crazy. The Ravens have a, a really clear path here. You were able to go chop it up and, and give yourself a nice little – summer's still here. It was 84 degrees today in good old Baltimore. But give yourself like a, a second sip of summer, I'll call it, uh, a little bit left. Like when you think your milkshake's out and you realize you just got a nice full bottom of it at Ocean's Calling. So how was it, my friend? Oh, it was great. I mean, the weather was a, a little bit of a dud for the first two days, but it wasn't terrible. Like there was driving rain at one point, but that was when uh, I was under the pavilion seeing Matt and Kim – and uh, I think Cheryl Crow was maybe on one of the other stages, like the outdoor stages. So people seeing Cheryl Crow were just getting pissed on. But uh, it was kind of a cool coincidence because she played, I think it's Soak Up the Sun is her big song. And she played that like yeah. as the sun came out. And then that's also when Matt and Kim played Daylight. And uh, people were just, there was a true mosh pit in Matt and Kim. Like it was, it was awesome. They were great. Uh, saw, as I was telling you before, we had to refire it up here. You know, saw Fitz in the Tantrum, saw Nathaniel Rateliff, saw John Mayer, a little disappointing, uh, in my opinion. I heard I heard that. Everybody I talked to that was there, too, said John Mayer was not uh, playing any of his classics. It was a lot of newer stuff people were unfamiliar with and just wasn't wasn't the most vibrant performance. It was, and it's not like, you know, I love John. I'm a big Dead & Company guy, especially, but I feel like his catalog maybe isn't like the live music thing, at least in my opinion. Like, I kind of like, when I'm seeing something live, I don't mind the occasional slow thing, but... It's just with him, it was just slow, 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 slow. I, I kind of like to be picked up a little bit, and, like, he, you know, closed it out on a slow one, and it was just like, man, like, it, at a certain point, I think when you're doing a live performance, you got to try to pick the people up a little bit, and uh, unfortunately, it didn't happen, but, you know, still love John. I uh, was just a little disappointed, but, yeah, just an overall uh, overall excellent weekend. My cup is feeling uh, pretty full right now, so. Love it. Glad to hear it. We're fired up. The Ravens should be pretty charged up. Make it through this this game as well, which we did cover instant analysis. We missed you on that, but Morgan Moses goes down. Harbaugh, you know, said it wouldn't be a long term thing. Hopefully, is the case. John can be reserving some things for maybe some trades and strategies. I didn't know that as we love to discuss on this show. But thing. able to make that through pretty cleanly. Then for Steelers Week, you're able to go say, "Hey guys, we're two and zero in the division on the road. If we take care of business, if we take this game as serious as death." We can go 3-0 and on the road in our own division, and then they have to come to our house. And clearly, if you're 3-0 and in your division this early in the season, you're the big dog. You're the, you're the big dog if you can do that. So I think the Ravens should be able to pick themselves up plenty in this one. Um, we, we talked about it on Sunday. Tons of fun. Went out to Mother's, able to have that easy win. And that nice, by halftime, you're up three scores. No trouble even at all in the second half. Did what you were supposed to do against a rookie quarterback in his first start. Whether it was a 1-1 Caleb Williams next year or a – I mean, the Ravens saw C.J. Stroud very high at the top of the draft, kept him out of the end zone. That's looking like a Dorian better Thompson. win week by week too. Exactly, exactly. I had some Steelers friends, friends that are like, oh, the Ravens beat the Texans and lost to the Colts and Joe Burrow's hurt and 
all those things. Okay, well, C.J. Stroud just tow you up from the flow up. So feeling pretty confident about that one if you're the Ravens in terms of what C.J. Stroud's offense was able to do. Texans had I, – I hammered the Steelers in that game. Spreads, everything. The Texans had five starting linemen out and took the Steelers to the woodshed still. So Pittsburgh's definitely uh, feeling up and down. The Browns are feeling weird right now. It was reported that Deshaun Watson actually was medically cleared to play but gave himself the bump, which – Kevin Don't Stefanski being the one that put that out there, who is, uh, this would not be his first time clashing with a quarterback. No, and that's a good point that you make. Uh, that it is a weird way to handle it. Maybe something that just never needed to be said publicly and had to be said with intention, almost. If you're that mindless and brainless to make that comment unintentionally, then you're not an NFL head coach, I would think. So, uh, clearly disdain there. The Browns drop one that they probably felt like they had a good shot of maintaining or competing or taking and now the Ravens are sitting pretty atop their division so looking at I mean our, our friend Mike Sands who we've had on and, and conversed with covering the Bengals made a great point he's like oh the Bengals always start slow ha ha well last year the Bengals were two and three with a positive point differential and lost those three games by three points or less this year they have a negative 45 point differential and this isn't the same old Bengals. Like they are getting drummed by three plus scores multiple times. So the Titans beat the crap out of the Bengals. And now you're looking at a Ravens offense that again, you say, Hey, maybe the Texans win looks better. Hey, maybe the Colts loss doesn't look quite as bad. They're not getting blown out. They just came all the way back against the Rams could have won that game. So, uh, you know, it's like the Ravens have had a bad half really against the Colts so far. And, kind of let the Bengals hang around a little. All the talking heads got in, like Ryan Clark, oh, Todd Munkin's offense this, and blah, blah, blah. The best thing I saw, I guess, as we start to dive into it, just overview, the Ravens are comfortable playing off of their defense, playing complimentary football, and playing the, the game of chicken of who wants to make a mistake first offensively. They're happy to play, I guess, I don't want to call it small ball, but call it like big ball, I guess, as we get into the mega culpa in a, in a moment. Wow. But it's like, it, it's, all right, we'll just strap up on D and punt the ball a little bit back and forth and let's see who budges first, who moves first. And Lamar Jackson, as this game goes on, has answers. That's what's different between Greg Roman's offense, Todd Mungin's offense. They're getting to the line. They use a little bit more receivers. They have better receivers. And... We watched Melvin Gordon on his big catch over Jeremiah Wusu koromoa the Lamar stopper. We watch him go, okay, let's ID this coverage. I have plenty of time pre-snap. Melvin Gordon goes and lines up in the, I think it's a split end or a, a tight end in the slot, something. Let's bring him back. Okay, I've got Jer Jeremiah Wusu koromoa in man coverage. I know the back side is locked up. At that point, they'd already seen the other side is probably zoned off. And then they did something. They ran essentially a pick route which we didn't see in Greg Roman's offense a ton. So obviously, I've always loved Greg Roman's run game, a lot of things there. Uh, you and I both kind of stayed on that horse a lo longer than most. We're like, all right, we're, we're ready to see a change here. It just, it just needs to be refreshed and rethought. The big question, I guess maybe to skip around and ask the one burning question, present, question presented by Black Eyed Susan Spice Company, go check out their red flag hot sauce. I'm addicted to it. I'm addicted to it. I, I need more. I need I need they're a gonna, They're going to be getting you some Captain Clyde's, too. I told them to hit all the Fed Hill boys up. So Captain Clyde's Cannonball Crush. Check that out, too. It's inspired by the Orange Crush. It's sick. Love it. Love it. So good. Check them out. BlackEyedSusanSpices.com. Promo code EXIT52 for 10% off your first order. My one burning question going into this year and to grow off of it was how much of Greg Roman's playbook is retained, especially in that run game. And the answer looks like a lot of it. So it's having a foundation you've built that's been one of the historically best run games in the history of the league, especially in the modern NFL, especially in the, like, let's say, Roger Goodell's NFL. You've got the elements, the power, the option, the crunch, all of those things, the traps, the whims, those things you're seeing, the diversity. And then Lamar has more time, pre-snap, more answers to make checks, and you end up seeing him float a ball gorgeously, confidently, before a pass rush could ever get there to a 30-year-old third-string running back that they you know, signed late in camp. So that's the difference. And my question is, 
how much more confident is Lamar Jackson going to get by the time it's December football? It looked like in two of the last three games, and if, if you want to lose a game out of the, the – Really, if you wanted to lose two, if you wanted to go two and two in this stretch, and you could pick your wins and losses, they would have lost to the Texans and lost to the Colts and beat their divisional opponents. Change that to three weeks, you'd rather lose to the Colts and beat the guys in your division. So we've seen pretty confident performances. My other crazy statement I'm going to make is that the Ravens are a road team. We'll talk about that later. The Ravens are not a home team right now; they're a road team. But how much more confident is Lamar Jackson going to get by the time you know things start to really form? in terms of who's leading the pack in the NFL and fighting for the playoff spots and the conference and things like that. And I think the answer is going to be a lot. Dude, this thing is a work in progress, like very much so. Beckham has barely played. Stanley has barely played. You've had issues with health with Linderbaum and a bunch of these guys, really. And it's... Uh, Dobbins. Do- I mean, Dobbins is gone. Dobbins is gone. Hill has been hurt. I mean, t- Hill is hurt. He, we saw him try to turn that play upfield... Uh, and get that first down. He got the first down, but like he could have gotten way more out of that. And I, I have a feeling it had something to do with that foot injury. It's a work in progress, man. This is uh this is men at work right now. Uh, and I don't think it's close to looking as good as it could. And I think people are getting on them a little bit for their lack of aggression in throwing down the field. I think we want to see more of that. Certainly uh, I do as well, but they're hitting on it when they are. And I'm just so struck through these four games, tactically, they're super sound to your point. There's a lot of the Roman concepts that we're still seeing. Counter bash, you know, he uses that again to great effect. Uh, Lamar Jackson scoring on uh, that play with the fake to Flowers and then following his guys upfield. Tactically, it's all there for me right now. The passing game could maybe use a little bit of work with the boundary guys, but we mentioned the health. That's an issue. Strategically and philosophically, I am struck by how patients, how patient, like they all look, Lamar in particular, like I, I feel like, and you, I think you made the point in your video that there have been games where he's played a little bit panicky. We haven't seen that from him really yet. I don't think even in the Colts game, they kind of just settled in and they continue to just try and do what they were doing. And that was maybe a little ill-advised. It obviously didn't really work in their favor. And then uh, I think finally they went up tempo on that touchdown drive that uh, kind of got them going a little bit. So maybe they could have done a little bit different in that game, but it just feels like they have a plan. They go out there and they stick to it. And it seems like Lamar Jackson has that plan in mind every single time he drops back. And there's been issues with connecting on, you know, some, uh, on, uh, some option plays with fumbling and stuff like that. You know, obviously that's still Mark, Mark Andrews was banged up too to can to even go further into your point to the it's men at work. Mark Andrews also banged up pretty much this whole time until this week. Yeah, no, and he looked he looked amazing, and that 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 was great. I think it was much needed. He was a big key in this game, and it just feels like it's not like this frantic. You know, to use a phrase of yours, it's not like a super saiyan confidence where it's just we're firebombing our way down the field and we're doing our little dances and shouting big trust. It feels like they've matured. It feels like they've kind of grown up in a way. Uh, and I think part of that has to do with the mindset. I mean, obviously we, we like to break things down from a tactical X's and O's perspective very much so, but like the weight that has been lifted off of his shoulders that has made him look like a different person in front of the microphone, in front of the camera, dealing with his teammates, even on social media, which is like kind of a funny way to analyze it, but he just seems lighter loosened up the black cloud is gone and i think that is showing in his play he looks as patient as mature as tactically sound and strategically just clear-minded as we've seen him in a very long time and it's very impressive mark andrews in this game we mentioned and one of my big things i was saying on this podcast on twitter hammer mark andrews over 800 yards receiving it was 800 and a half Misses a game there, ends up having a big get, big day in this one, looks back. And there's a question of like, all right, who would be the top dog? Who's going to be the top dog? Odell Beckham, uh, nobody's making the play on the ball that he made in the back. I mean, that was unbelievable. Uh, uh, just, I don't even know what to say about it. Spectacular, stupendous, wow. Wow. Everything. Everything there. Mark Andrews is the mayor, the governor of Ohio. Through 21 games, Mark Andrews has 16 touchdowns against the Bengals and Browns. He's played the Bengals 10 times, 578 yards, 50 catches, 7 touchdowns. The Browns he's played 11 times, 48 for 621, and 9 scores. 
Mark Andrews owns the state of Ohio. Justin Tucker owns Detroit, has property in Detroit. That whole state just belongs to Mark Andrews. In the run game, like the Ravens missed him in the run game. He is working in the run game. One of the probably lesser known, and it, it's ironic right now, the Travis Kelsey, Taylor Swift, everybody's like sick of that or has an opinion or loves it or whatever. And I, I was like talking to my mom about it just because it's fun. It, you know, that's she, that's her level. My mom's almost 70. So it's her level. I, I was happy to talk about that with my mom. And it, I was explaining my mom loves Mahomes too, which is just driving. My mom's listening to this right now. Drives me nuts. She loves Mahomes so much. She's like, I, I'm going to start watching more Chiefs games. This was even before the Taylor Swift stuff. I'm going to watch more Chiefs games. But I was like, she's like, oh, why was everybody so upset about Mahomes Sunday? I was like, well, he threw a couple interceptions and, and didn't play that great. She goes, wow, he threw interceptions? Wow. Like, shocked. He threw interceptions. Wow. And it was just, okay, he did. He is human. He threw a couple of things. I was explaining to her. I was like, well. The Chiefs used to have this guy, Tyreek Hill, who's really fast, smaller guy, strong, fast, crazy good. And then it was, so it was him and Travis Kelsey. And now he doesn't have Tyreek Hill. Travis Kelsey was hurt a little bit. And I was like, it was kind of like, you know, Lamar hasn't really had a guy like Tyreek Hill or, or really had that guy at receiver necessarily. Hollywood. My mom didn't love Hollywood. And it's was like, well, now it's kind of like Zay Flowers. He's not quite that Tyreek Hill guy, but it's a guy like that. that you know, Zay can just be a jitterbug and everybody's looking at it. She goes, oh, yeah. I watched this video about how everybody kind of like moves where he moves. I was like, yeah. I was like, Mark Andrews a lot like Kelsey. So I was like, there you go, mom. Ha ha. Now, as soon as you start to like the Chiefs, maybe the Ravens have a little more firepower. But uh, I was just thinking about Mark Andrews, man, like for how loud a Travis Kelsey is for that skill set. And hey, Mark Andrews doesn't have 1,300 yards or whatever, you know, five years in a row. But putting up Hall of Fame numbers as a tight end before 30 years old, like putting up gold jacket numbers as a tight end. I was thinking that recently, and I was wondering if that was a controversial take, but it, it just, like, watching him, it's definitely there, and numerically, it do, it feels like it's on the way there, too. He's had these 1,000-yard seasons, double-digit touchdowns consistently. It's it's He feels like he's inching towards it. A hundred percent. At this point, I mean, in his career, this is Mark Andrews' sixth year. He has 37 touchdowns uh, through really five years in a couple games. He's putting up 107 and 73, 180 receptions, uh, 10 touchdown, nine touchdowns, seven touchdown. Last year, this is a couple games, you know, I played with a backup quarterback, still put up 847 and five touchdowns on 73 receptions. This year could easily, you know, another eight, nine thousand yards, another eight, nine, ten touchdowns. How long is he going to keep doing it? Probably a while. He looks good. Tight ends age well. Their game ages well. Travis Kelsey. So, I just wanted to shout out Mark Andrews. And, and again, I think one of maybe the most underrated things about him, who he's a quieter guy. Like he, he's a quiet star. He's a star in this league. I, I'd say for a tight end, he's a, he's a, everybody knows him fantasy football. You draft him in the top 40 the last two years. He's a high pick in fantasy stuff like that. I mean, people have him on their team and rely on him and he's a quiet guy, but had a superstar loud performance and you know what he did in the end zone, what he did after the catch, what he did to go, you know, put that second touchdown in and, and make a guy miss again and all those things. Great. But in the run game, man, he has improved so much over the last few years from what he was at Oklahoma, really not a tight end to being an effective deployable blocker that can handle defensive ends that can climb to linebackers. He's good in space. The Ravens run game missed him and, and just really wanted to give Mark Andrews his flowers on this jumbo set because that man is headed towards a gold jacket type of career. Obviously, you need to, you know, get a Super Bowl in there, get some more all pros, Pro Bowls, whatever. But what is he, 27, 28 years old right now? He's 28. So that's prime time for tight ends. 27 through 32 is like when they amass their bulk of their statistical prowess. So uh shout out Mark Andrews. One of the all time I mean, he's turning into an all time great Raven, especially on the offensive side of the ball. Yeah, he definitely is. And uh, I mean, he, it might hold up for him for even longer. Like Kelsey's getting up there a little bit and he still looks as kind of lithe and uh, uh, sort of Dustin Johnson like is how I would describe him. Just super smooth, like just like, you know, I, I wouldn't call Kelsey a low key guy, but he's almost like low key. Like you don't expect him to do some of the shit that he's able to do. I think back to 2021, uh, the game where the Ravens actually uh, beat the Chiefs uh, and he had that. <laughs> That catch and run screen, that was one of the craziest things I've ever seen in my life. He's so fucking good. And you you make a good point there about the comparison between the two because I think Kelsey, like even before all this Taylor Swift stuff, like he he was, I think, a bit of a marketable celebrity. He was doing 
Uh, a lot of commercials. He did Catching Kelsey, which is hilarious to look back on. He's he's doing the podcast with Jason. He's so. got the podcast that's yeah. like number one. Even even before the Taylor Swift stuff, it was a top three like sports podcast on every chart. Yeah, no. So he's uh, he's definitely been putting his profile out there. And I mean, if Mark doesn't want to do that, that's totally cool. Obviously, we've interviewed him before. We we've heard some stuff about how uh, how cool of a guy that he uh, you know is off the field, and uh, you know we we love Mark. So you know if his if he doesn't want to raise his celebrity profile, I think that's totally cool because I think his play is uh, doing the talk for him and yeah i think he will eventually be a hall of famer so yeah it is uh it is good to give a guy like that his flowers because you see what you're missing when he is not in the game man like and he hasn't been hurt a ton over the course of his career but when he has been he also like, has diabetes that's the other thing like yeah like he just railroads through that like it's nothing is an advocate for children mark andrews is is a great pillar i think becoming a pillar of the ravens franchise especially in the post ray lewis era yeah, he's and he's Lamar's dude, like uh, through and through. We can always we can talk about oh Beckham is going to bring this, and maybe he still will. Uh, I, I'm certainly optimistic that he will. Zay Flowers, obviously, his star is rising in a big way. Makes another big play uh, on the uh, the long uh, catch uh, on the crossing route there in this game. But yeah, no, I mean it's it's Mark. It was always Mark. Mark's not or Lamar's not throwing the ball to anyone on this team other than Mark Andrews in the back of the end zone like that. Yeah, no, I mean, and why would he? Nobody, funny enough, like I've talked about like the height of this receiving core. I, I feel like it's kind of a little bit more of a concern than we realize sometimes because like there's absolutely no one that he could attempt that pass to, like even physically attempt that pass to because Mark is just like towers over some of these defensive backs. Certainly. So I guess to move into the mega culpa, which we got to make a fun sound in the fun little fun little thing that'll be a project for this week the Mergo Copa. We'll, we'll we'll postulate something up there but the thing that i thought and, and i had cory kinnon on you're down the ocean had cory kinnon brown's wire on and the, the stupid thing that i didn't realize the the stupid idiot dumb thing i didn't think about john harbaugh moved to 25 and 6 against the browns with this win talk about owning ohio i mean uh, maybe not the bengals quite as much but just owns the browns the browns Gave me fool's gold. I thought with Corey, he thought Deshaun Watson would play. I said the Ravens would lose a, cl a close one, 21-22, I think was my prediction, something like that. The Browns can't tackle the Ravens. The Browns' defensive players, no matter what stats they have or who it is, can't tackle Baltimore Ravens. Lamar puts them in a blender. Gus Edwards chewed them up. You mentioned Justice Hill. Mark Andrews forces broken tackles. Zay Flowers made... Walker and Awusu Koromoa run into each other. It was just like a seven yard gain on a, a screen or a quick pass, or no, it was a quick little drag route. Made two of them run into each other, made Taki Taki like do a dance move across his face. And then luckily, like two of the Browns defensive linemen hustled their ass off to get back and rally and make the tackle. Otherwise, he was going to smoke them. That Justice Hill screen that got called back, that was like a 65 yard play. Um, and you, you shout out his foot, you make a good point. I think Hill is definitely playing not 100%. Harbaugh made a comment in a post-game press conference, or maybe I think it was post-game, that they had to hold Hill back still. His, his foot's clearly not right. Tough guy, played through it. What he did coming back from his Achilles injury last year was nuts. No one really talks about that either. But uh, the Browns can't tackle the Ravens. The Browns can't stop power. I thought maybe Jim Schwartz would be the answer. They have Dalvin Tomlinson. They have uh, Shelby Harris. They have Garrett, obviously, Zadarius Smith. You know, People are singing the praise of their safeties and everything. Browns can't stop power, they can't stop counter, and they can't tackle the Ravens. So that's my mega culpa. I'm a, I'm a bozo for not having that realization. And uh, even if Deshaun Watson played in this game, hey, maybe maybe the Browns are able to you know go score two, three touchdown or two. Let's say one or two long touchdown drives, something like that. Play a similar game to what the Ravens did, maybe early dink dunk, run the ball a little. Browns didn't have the horses on offense, which we did talk about in that preview, but just can't stop the Ravens' run game. And, and Todd Munkin, like I said. The burning question, what can Munkin retain from this offseason, from the last four years of Greg Roman? A lot. They've retained a lot of it, and it looks good. Um, handoffs looked a little sketch. I think even, even on good plays, like I think the running backs look good. I think guys are in and out, practice time not that much. Hill, Edwards have missed, you know, missed practice, missed time, all those things. Handoffs look sloppy. Footwork looks sloppy. They're not getting to the, the exchange cleanly. And the exchanges aren't clean either. So something I want to see them clean up, and, and maybe it takes a little while. But um, I thought all the backs looked good. Melvin Gordon was rumbling. So Browns can't tackle the Ravens, and that's where I'm a big dummy. I think we just have a general, between the both of us, mega culpa to issue on Melvin Gordon. I mean, he's looked pretty good, and no fumbling issues. Granted, it hasn't been a ton of action for him thus far, but looked good, ran hard, almost had a touchdown there on the run down the left side. 
and then uh, the little wheel route that he ran that uh, that really kind of helped put the game uh, on ice, I think, where Lamar just dropped a perfect uh, pass into the bucket there. But he was well covered, and to his credit, he made the catch and picked up the first down on third and six there. So uh, just general mega culpo and Melvin Gordon, who I think we were both pretty down on as a signing in general. He's still, like, not the ideal option. Like, I, I'd probably keep He looks him. good, though, man. I mean, he looks good. Yeah, yeah. I'd still keep looking on the trade market. But as far as a replacement guy that you pick, off the, pick, pick up off the street – can't ask for much more than uh, what he's giving you thus far. Playing hard. Playing hard. All you can ask. Play hard. Run hard. Hit holes hard. That catch was awesome. Probably the best back in pass pro, which when they did sign him, and so I said, you know, they need somebody. You could be like, all right, if shit hits the fan, I've got somebody I can put in on third down, pick up the blitz, you know, to go go run for four yards if I need, things like that. So definitely hammering that. Earns, earn more touches. Deserves more touches deserves to be a part of the game plan a little bit there and, and have that nice rotation that fantasy football players hate, but the Ravens have loved for, for years and years. So uh, with that, I mean, I guess we can transition to our next segment, the smooth AF smooth play of the week. There were a lot in this game to think of. Um, I'm going to pick mine going out of showing love. I could have picked a lot of Lamar Jackson moments. You know, I highlighted him on YouTube. I'm going to go with Brandon Stevens smoothly, cleanly, making sure he secured an interception early in that game, getting up and showing, hey, did you know I was a four-star running back? Hey, have you heard that I was a four-star running back that went to UCLA? And it's maybe your favorite fact of like any player on this roster, by the way. Hey, did you know Brandon Stevens is a four-star running back? People forget. People do forget. Gets up, flips the field. No panic. Brandon Stevens in general has been, has been playing corner. And John Harbaugh, well, hey, whenever Harbaugh comes back or next week, it sounded like is the and they expect him back this game in London. Brandon Stevens is the other guy in the corner. He said that. Stevens just been playing the role. So to me, that was the smooth AF play of the week. And and Brandon Stevens has been playing smooth AF. Yeah, he sure has. I uh, I had a similar play uh, with one Geno Stone, who just kind of feels like he's turning into a guy that's able to. Bait quarterbacks kind of hide back there a little bit, uh, you know, a, a very, very, very diet Ed Reed kind of thing where you're just laying back and wait in the tall grass. And then, uh, you know, he knows when to pounce. He uh, had the game turning interception there in Cincinnati, uh, which was in the end zone on Joe Burrow, obviously. And then uh, he had this one, which Mike McDonald shouted him out in the locker room after the game. He said we needed one more to uh, close the game out. And, uh, you know, DTR, obviously some tough decision making, three interceptions, one to uh, Kyle Hamilton as well. But, uh, yeah, Gino kind of closing the game out there was uh, my my smooth AF play of the week. We've been talking a lot about the offense due to uh, all the controversy that we've seen with it over the last couple of years, all the change that we've seen. This defense has just consistently been good the last couple of years. I know there were issues at the end of 2021. That's why Mike McDonald is in town in the first place. But uh, they've, uh, you know, been pretty much a rock uh, since McDonald came, aside from a few hiccups like the Dolphins game last year and things of that nature. So, uh, this just felt like uh, another vintage Mike Mack performance, and I think he's got his guys, and Gino is one of them. Mike McDonald is a superstar, and once once this keeps going, and the Ravens start to creep towards the playoffs, as long as Lamar Jackson stays healthy, they're going to the playoffs. Uh, I'll, I'll announce that now. They're going to look, and they, being the national media, is going to start looking at Mike McDonald. He's in his thirties. He's clean cut. He's well-spoken. He went and did the whole Michigan take down Ohio State thing, which I can just – I'm sure Kyle Brand has already even talked about it, but Kyle Brand's just going to keep you – know, him and Schrager are going to love Mike Mack. They're bro. They're bro and be more. And ultimately, I, I just enjoy him while he's here because uh, he could very well be going next year. King of sim pressure in the NFL right now, I'll go as far as to say, just, just from what I've seen. And, and I obviously focus on the Ravens 90% out of my 100% to give in terms of film and stuff goes to the Ravens. But enjoy him while he's here. He's a stud. He's a superstar. And the Ravens have a pro, like, a defensive program. The program is strong. The Baltimore Ravens defensive identity, the program, couldn't be stronger. Talking about the offensive guys that have missed time, well, you've got edge rushers off the street. You've got cornerbacks that you weren't expecting to be thrust into where they are. Uh, Marcus Williams is out. You know, they're missing Ojabo, Owe, and Tyus Bowser in this game and are just beating the crap out of an NFL team in their division. So 
give Mike McDonald his flowers too. I think we're going to be talking about him for some some pretty serious awards and accolades and things like that at the end of the year. But those were our Smooth AF plays of the week presented by Baltimore's own Smooth as Boop. If you're not using their line of his and hers shaving creams, moisturizers, and shampoos, you ain't that smooth. When a Baltimore master barber wanted to use the best shaving cream possible, he decided, I'll make my own. Shave, moisturize, wash, and condition. Also, if you're tired of his and hers, the stupid marketing of his and hers, the pink razor, the blue, the, the man, the... It's ours now. So you can check out their his and hers products, consolidate your bathroom space. Go check out their CBD shaving and grooming products that will leave you feeling relaxed, smelling good, and looking better at smoothafproducts.com. Awesome. With that, with that, I think we can we can get our, our other one. We're doing some segments here. Anything else that comes to mind, but we'll we'll do our Johnny Cake. We'll we'll make a fun little animation. Or Johnny Crab we'll, Cake, that. brought to you by Jimmy's Famous Seafood. How about that? Johnny Crab Cake. God, look at you. There we go. We're just bro- growing segments here. Like and subscribe. Share this podcast with a friend. Show us five stars if you're listening. If you're still listening, if, again, if you can listen on YouTube, we would love if you could. If you can't, that's okay, too. As you listening Johnny to this, Cake- by the way, to Jimmy Seafood, uh, another event with Eric is being hosted tonight as you're listening to this to uh, with a little meet and greet with D.L. Hall. So if you're interested in another Crab Cakes in baseball, if you've already been to one or if you want to check it out, go to their website, jimmysfamousseafood.com. See if you can get tickets. I don't know if any will still be available, but I uh, just thought I'd shout that out because that is going on tonight, Wednesday. Yeah, we have some big ideas for what we want to do at Jimmy's upcoming for sure, as well as we continue to grow and formulate what we want to do and, and where we want to take this podcast and all the fun stuff we've liked doing over the last couple of years and continuing to make it better. So the Johnny crab cake of the week for me, give it to the boy from saloon, Iowa, give it to Tyler Linderbaum, who from what we heard was just trying to rub some dirt on a high ankle sprain and get back out there last week with a high ankle sprain comes back in this week, locks it down, locks it up in the middle, has a boot scoop, butt into the end zone, uh, throwing it all, giving full effort, Rub some dirt on it. And, hey, the Ravens are taking it playing safe with you know some guys that have had some injuries, things like that. I don't want to throw any shade at them necessarily. But Tyler Linderbaum fucking rubbed some dirt on it, got back after a week, got back into practice, played, and did the damn thing. So thought that was awesome. Shout out to him for, for putting it all on the line. I want to see some Linderbaum jerseys start to trickle into the stadium as he continues to grow and get better, which I, I expect he will fully do. So that's my Johnny Crab Cake beefcake of the week mr linderbaum and i'll just shout out as well i did nail justin matabike owns wyatt teller justin matabike gets a big sack and just fucking owns wyatt teller so that was awesome too mm, mine is uh actually it's it's also on the off uh, uh, offensive side of the ball uh but it is in fact a running back and it is not a run you're gonna like this it is pass protection uh let's see if we can pull this up here actually uh shout out to brandon thorne breaking down some film here Miles Garrett's get off on this play. He absolutely beats Patrick McCarry like a drum. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can see Gus Edwards coming in and saving Lamar Jackson's skin. If he does not uh, does not make this block, we might be talking about another injury situation right now. God forbid. I don't want to bring that up, of course. But uh, that was the first thing I saw when I saw this. So an unremarkable play otherwise, but a nice job by a running back and pass protection. They need as much of this as they can get right now with a handicapped offensive line. Shout out to Gus Edwards. Looking good in the run game, but uh, we love to see him getting in there and making the big uh, the big beefcake block on Miles Garrett, who is just freaking unblockable. This is so good. Miles Garrett, I realized, unfortunately, is just Joe Thomas at defensive end. Like You tweeted story. that. I, I immediately knew what you meant. I think some people were confused by it. I was like, yep, that's, that checks out. That's exactly right. 10,000 days at the factory of sadness part two poor miles care he's a hall of famer and just the browns are doing whatever the hell kevin stefanski sean watson whatever the hell is going on there so shout out miles garrett absolute stud the ravens are gonna have to face a couple other absolute stud pass rushers primo position studs tj watt alex highsmith cam hayward is out still if i'm not mistaken tweak the groin and, and will miss this one still I don't think he's close. I'll have to double check. Maybe I think he was speaking. IR, so I think he would have to be. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Yep. So uh, a couple guys that can bring the noise. We'll see what happens with Morgan Moses. By the time we're listening, we might have an injury report. Or by the time you're listening, you might have an injury report. Um, I would guess that McCary. If I had to guess, I'd say McCary goes to right tackle. If I had to guess. Falele, Harbaugh mentioned, pardon me, didn't have uh, a couple. There was a couple of plays that he was really upset about. 
didn't look great coming off the bench uh, from what I saw. Look, and, and I want to sing the praise of Falele. I was high on him. I want to have my preconceived bias that he was a great pick, and I like that the Ravens drafted him. I would love to, but did not look good, did not look quick, did not look confident, got beat like a drum several times quick. Was a, a sore in the second half, I would say, of the Ravens' offense. Rounded out, you know, finished a little longer, sure. But maybe he was just coming off the bench, maybe just – not looking great. Would love to see him look better. So I would think that maybe wants you to have McCarry. So McCarry having to basically switch sides, go from Miles Garrett to TJ Watt. I mean, give, give that man a million dollar bonus for, for that effort if you're going to do that. So looking forward to that one. Um, really, I guess that kind of does it for us. We'll have settle up with a settle man here. But I think this Baltimore Ravens team, we'll see. Maybe the Steelers can can do some devil magic in a divisional game. Hey, TJ Watt is there. Hey, Micah Fitzpatrick, some other guys. Who knows? It's AFC North football. Anything can happen. But I think this Ravens team, man, to kind of end it as we go to settle up with the settle, man, I think they're going to be having some pretty serious accolades and spotlight coming over the next couple of games here. I think this team is really fucking good. And if they can stay healthy, they're going to start winning a lot of games and rolling. This kind of reminds me of that 2019 season. It was like, eh, sloppy. Maybe it could have been 2-2. Two and two, and maybe they ended up at 3-2. and two. We'll see. But I think they're going to hit the ground running. The idea here on paper was that, hey, we've got players that are still banged up and we need to maybe milk, uh, give those guys a little extra milk, a little time on the, the IR, hit the ice baths and let them take their time. Ronnie Stanley, Rashad Bateman, Odell Beckham, Tyus Bowser. Uh, be careful with those guys. I mean, it might have been the strategy. Maybe you're not going to be a smooth operator in September, but man, oh man, if they can get those guys back, they can stay a little healthy. I think this team can do some serious damage. I don't think their schedule is going to be Anything crazy, as Jack has said a couple times, you know they're they're favored in every game until the the 49ers at this point. So, man, I think this team can be pretty good. Maybe they lose one here or, or next week or whenever, but I think this is going to be that that double digit probable division champ. Uh, I hate ESPN's probabilities and win pro. Those things I think are always imperfect and always growing. So the one from five years ago that people are condescending, oh, our win probability. Probably looks like crap today. There's probably a 30% difference in your win probability that you're so confident in. But has a 90.8% chance of the Ravens winning the division. Mitch Trubisky, Lamar Jackson, man, I mean, I'm probably going to be taking the Ravens to win. I like betting on quarterbacks and head coaches, and I'm going to take Lamar Jackson and John Harbaugh over a very good coach with Mitch Trubisky in all likelihood. So anything else from you, my friend? Yeah, I mean, or banged up Kenny Pickett, which I'd probably rather see a banged up Kenny Pickett, but we'll see what happens. Um, you know, he's going to be practicing as you're listening to this, they said on Wednesday, so it might just be a smoke screen, but yeah, we'll see. I mean, the Ravens still very much injured in their own right, but I mean, this coaching staff is doing an amazing job. I think you've got a, a standard bearer there, a quarterback who's doing a great job of, uh, of his own. And then on defense, it's a lot of guys that are just sort of filling in, but you've got an absolute flag carrier in Roquan Smith. Uh, who is just firing these guys up every single week, it seems like. And uh, he gets the game ball in the uh, the win at Cleveland, and they're, uh, you know, they're kind of ragging on him a little bit uh, in, in a good-natured way for just how— He ragged uh, on himself and was like, you guys have heard enough speeches out of me. Yeah, exactly. Me yeah. yeah, and it just feels like they haven't— like they've had guys that have done like the middle of the— uh, middle of the— you know, huddle speech thing that Ray Lewis used to do. It doesn't feel like they've had a presence like Ray Lewis— you know, or quite like Ray Lewis since this guy. And this is a guy that they can rally around, I think, on that side of the ball, and I think they're doing it very much. Uh, I think I'll probably be picking it to continue as well, but of course we'll get into it uh, on the preview. So that is all I got. And if you want to throw it over to the uh, the settlement, we can uh, we can go ahead and do that and get out of here. Love it. The settlement's becoming, we weren't exactly sure. We just like Jack. He's from the area. We get content and wanted to, wanted to collaborate. So I'm excited about the settlement. We, we Pulling the curtain back as we like to do. We record those first, right before the episode. It just kind of loosens Jake and I up. We talk a little, little general ball, little things like that. So we like settle up with the settle man. Hope you guys enjoy. Uh, please listen on YouTube, subscribe, like. We're really trying to build out the YouTube. Uh, I don't know why we've spent the last five years not really just focused on primarily YouTube. It pays the best and all that stuff. But now that we're more independent, have our own freedom, we can do whatever the hell we want. It's a lot of fun. I'm having a lot of fun. Week five. It's going fast, guys, so let's enjoy it. Let's enjoy every play, every week, every episode, everything we can do. Let us know what you want to see, any ideas you have. Orioles, this Sunday, hit me up on Twitter. Maybe a little meetup could be before or after the game. Uh, I know Eric will be there, I'm guessing. Maybe Brian. I don't, I don't know what your plans are, Jake, but 
the Baltimore Orioles in the ALDS. Uh, Going to be a ton of fun. So fired up. Baltimore is upon us almost. It's still summer. Still, this is like third summer. We'll get fourth summer in there. But Baltimore, it's, it's here. It's here. It's Baltimore. It's still summer, but it's Baltimore. So love it. Love what we're doing. And I guess we can throw it to the settlement. Let's do it. All right. We now welcome on. Welcome back. The settlement. Time to settle up with our boy, Jack Settlement. Jack, you're out there. Boots on the ground. Our correspondent, we decided officially, the Thursday night correspondent. We have Jack Settlement of Snapback Sports, Underdog Football, the Punchline Podcast. Coming back. We're rolling. We're rolling through this season, baby. I'm fired up. Bring some heat, Jack, baby. You went out. Exactly. You went out. You uh, got to go see the Lions. I feel like in a that was a state that was a statement game. Jack, what was it like? Lambeau Field. Lions Nation took over, and I'm two and zero at Lions games this year. So if Detroit wants to send me around, I mean they're actually fun to watch. The fans are traveling, and they're the most confident fans ever. They know that they're going to win these games. It's honestly incredible to watch. Like the the most impressive part was Week One. They go into Kansas City, and like they're telling people, "We're going to beat the defending champs on Banner Night." They knew they were going to beat Green Bay. They traveled in bunches. They took over the stadium. Lambeau is still my favorite stadium in the entire NFL. If you're a sports fan, try and make it out to Lambeau. I've never been. I've been to, to FedEx Field once before. I've never been for a Commanders game. Commanders Bears coming off a divisional matchup, NFC North in Lambeau to Bears versus Commanders. Maybe, you know, some highs and lows here, but... I'm excited. It's Thursday Night Football in the flesh. This is what you look forward to. It's the game of the week that you're going to complain about. You're going to be annoyed tweeting about. But if you're not locked in for three hours, what are you doing? Like, you're, you're going to be watching. The Orioles don't play until Saturday. There's nothing else to be worried about. So I'm pumped to, you know, go home to the DMV, enjoy some, you know, time at home. How are you feeling so my- about the reputation of Thursday Night Football right now? Some of these primetime games have been a little bit of a dud. Well, that's not Thursday night. That's Jets and Giants who continue to get Sunday and Monday night. I understand why the Jets obviously had a ton of prime time. I don't understand why the Giants. I My friends joke with me that I'm always like the Giants are my second team because last year I was hyping them up. I loved Brian Dable. I, I was like, this team's going to win the division. This team's going to go to the playoffs. I genuinely believe he can influence games enough because he's such a good play caller. He took them to the playoffs. Eagles were too good. They were never winning that division. But this year, I was like, this Giants team did not get better. They got worse. They signed Jones. Saquon started. Like, I, I did never see a path for this Giants team. So, now this is the quintessential Thursday night football game, though. Like, you're, you're it, talking. It sure would be a shame, right, if you if you pick the Giants to win the NFC in your, yeah. your NFL preseason prediction. That would just be mega tough, right? Uh, that makes, that makes one that. of us here that didn't believe in them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, uh, it was. Yeah, it was, that that would be. It tough. was me. It would. It would be pretty <laughs> um, tough. I, I I believed. I believed in Dayball, and I'm, I'm now I'm joking with my my friends who are Giants fans, saying like, "Is he just McAdoo 2.0? Is this just McAdoo again? Just one shiny year, and then an absolute dumpster think, fire." Look, I I think Jones. I the way I look at quarterbacks is I have three tiers. One good when you know anything happens. One, good when good things are happening, and one, they're just not good. So, like, for example, Lamar Jackson, I don't care the system. I don't care the, the weapons. He's going to be a good quarterback. Jones, is it, he's, when things are going well, he actually can be very, very good for your team. When you don't have O-line, when you don't upgrade the weapons, when you're playing from behind, out of script, like, you're not going to be successful. And then there's Desmond Ritter, that he gets his own tier because it doesn't matter what he does. He's not good. So... Giants are not good. Commanders are not good. The Bears are not good. I will be there on Thursday night. I'm excited. They they did get a better schedule this year on Thursdays than traditionally. I think they're giving Amazon, you know, a, they're throwing them at least a little bit of a bone. And it doesn't seem like there will be as many players out for a Thursday night. I would hope Saquon comes back. Or he, he played last night. Yeah, I don't think anyone's really injured for either team. So we'll see. Yeah, FedEx Field itself, I've, I've been there quite a few times, and I think the tailgating setup, it's just one of those stadiums that just has endless, it's like strawberry fields forever of just parking lot. And the the classic 
R word fans are still there. There's still those vibes, the buses, the old school, the eighties, nineties vibes are still strong there. So really curious to hear it next week when you come back. Like, I feel like commanders fans are insanely fired up about Josh Harris buying the team. Sam Howe just had such a fun performance. Obviously eight and a half point underdogs. Sam Howe throws a game tying touchdown. You know, riverboat, river, riverboat. What are we doing? Like how, I don't even understand. I, I, I genuinely don't understand. What is the thesis behind not going for two? Like, talk me through you're going to beat them now in overtime. Like, I don't even get it. I, I can't begin to understand it. If they were two and two, and it's not their first game back in, in D.C., but it's their second game, there is a lot of hype behind this team. And, and the fans are excited. One and three, playing the Bears. It feels more like it's going to be one of those stressful games where if they don't win, they're going to be like, oh, it's just another disaster for Washington. If they do win, they're going to be like, all right, we took care of business. I'll say, you know, maybe I'm just hyping this up so I can sit through it. But like what made Monday night so miserable is that the Giants couldn't move the ball. They got sacked 11 times. This game could be fireworks. Like the Bears can't stop anyone. The commanders don't seem to be able to stop many people. Maybe Fields runs wild. Hal throws for 300. Like it could be an entertaining game. Maybe from a betting perspective, I don't know. Better, better than last night for sure. It could, and the Bears. I mean, at the same time, such a. My, I went pretty heavy on the Broncos. I ended up, I think I ended up losing like a unit and a quarter because I was stacking alt spreads on the Broncos. My my bet strategy was, I'm gonna see if the Bron- if the Bears are the worst team in football, and it's not close. <laughs> Like yeah. if they're just going to go two and two and fifteen, and it's a dumpster fire. So I I went like Broncos minus twelve and a half, minus nine and a half, minus six and a half, and then I put a bunch on them money line and to cover three. So I pushed, and I think I ended up losing like a, a little bit. I had some other stuff going on them, but um, from that, you know, Justin Fields, my boy, another another not great take of mine. As things stand, we'll see. Dayball will get it right. Justin Fields will emerge as a prince of greatness. But at least he looked electric. The Broncos can't stop anyone. Um, as we're looking into this one, I mean, five and a half point spread as things sit. Commanders are minus 245. Bears are plus 200 money line. Over under 45, 44 and a half. And as I was flicking around here, I mean, I think Brian Robinson is a beast in this game. I think Brian Robinson is an animal in this game. I think he is in general. I love that dude. I think him and Najee Harris, I do have an affinity for Alabama football players. I think anyone who's listening to this podcast in whatever form it's been in a long time. I love Will Anderson. I love Najee Harris. I love Brian Robinson. I like Alabama. I like that program I'm a fan of. So I'm going to, I'm going to hammer some Brian Robinson action in this one. I tried to say Uh, this to you a few weeks ago and you weren't having it. (laughs) That's fine. That's fine. The Najee, Najee Harris is where I'm like drawing the line. I think that's kind of my, one of my classic Twitter litmus tests. Like, do you know that Najee Harris is a good football player or not? He is a good football player. Positional value, bro. Wait, that, why is he a good football player? Because I think he's not a good football player. Because he wow. makes good reads. He's a power back who also is awesome in pass pro. He has great hands. He runs good routes. We saw him toast Roquan Smith for a game-winning touchdown, 25 yards downfield, jumping, skying over him. The Steelers haven't had a notable player on their offensive line or really a tight end that is like I – mean, they do get Washington now, who I think will develop into that. But they haven't had a notable presence as an offensive line. I, the one guy that baffled me, Kevin Dotson, the offensive lineman they had, uh, they traded him to the Rams, and it, it befuddled me. So the the stat I like there is that his yards before contact are usually under like one, one and one point two, very low. His yards after, and some of that can be him not being super explosive, sure. Yards yeah. after contact have gone up every year. Last year he had a plate in his foot he had taken out, so could see some things then. But uh, I think he's just a really balanced runner, and I think they have a good thing in Jalen Warren and Najee Harris. That's a perfect little duo to me. And fantasy football-wise, I get it. Najee's not you know, churning out 27 and a half points. A lot of people have drafted him the first. I think he is good at real-life football very, very, very much so. I think he's a zone runner, a gap runner, all those things. So that's my my. Yeah, I think – no, I think 15 years ago, it's not even the positional value of running back. It's the positional value and the style of running back that he is, is the lowest. Like in today's game where you're just trying to rip off huge runs, right? Where Who, like, who leads the NFL in explosive run rate this year? He Najee does, Harris. But, 
But how does he have how does he have one carry over ten yards only because of a bad offensive line or because he's not explosive? I think last year he wasn't explosive enough. I think he is now explosive enough, yeah. healthy, and it is bad offensive line. But I mean, Matt Canada, Matt Canada is elite bad. Like yeah, no, unquestionably he's, he's, bottom shelf. Hey, let's, let's, let's hype up Najee. Let's hype up Najee and hope he fails this weekend. I'm exactly, I'm cool with that. Exactly. You know, no bulletin board material for Najee Harris. Um, what are what am I betting this week? I think if what you're you betting, betting I think if you're betting the Bears, you're a sicko. Which there's nothing wrong with that. You took the Jets on Sunday Night Football. You're a sicko. You got rewarded for that. Sickos win. Uh, sickos win a decent amount of the time as well. But I think Vegas is a sicko. Yeah, Vegas. Yeah, Vegas is is a sicko. But I'm not betting the Bears. Uh, maybe I am. What I am doing is I'm betting on Justin Fields to just run wild, and I'm taking over 49 and a half rush yards. You can look at his stats this year. He has not been running the ball. Now the season's over, in my opinion. Like the Bears aren't climbing out of an own four hole, but. Maybe they'll try. I think a report came out that Eberflus is on the maybe the chopping block. They said if he loses on Thursday, he'll get fired. If I'm the coach and I'm trying to retain my job, there it is. It's everything I got. And what do the Bears do best? It's when Justin's running wild. So I like that. You know, if they're trailing, he'll run. If they're leading, he'll run. Although Herbert looked pretty good on Sunday. So I like Justin Fields over. I would love to take the over in the game. I think 44 and a half is sneaky low for these two teams, how bad their defenses have been. But I will say between Brian Robinson running crazy and between potentially fields and Herbert and even Roshan, that clock will be turning quickly. So then you're counting on, you know, fields potentially scoring touchdowns in the red zone, not settling for field goals. So that number gets shaky, but I do, I do like points to be scored. And once again, I could be talking myself into something. This could be 10 to 3 in mid-third quarter like it was last night. But I, I, I do see some offense in this game. I agree. I got. I also see uh, Sam Howell to throw an interception is plus 114 on DraftKings right now. He's had five this season already. I know four were in one game. But, I mean, seems like a decent little thing to just sprinkle something on. I think I might do that right now. And I do feel like they're going to be trying to air it out. So maybe Jaquan Brisker gets, gets uh, underneath one or something. And, uh, you know. You make it make a nice little uh, nice little coinage off that Sam how to throw speaking of that speaking of that the reason why I might not ride how to to throw an interception is because playing the game script right how's thrown a ton of passes over the last few weeks they've been behind they're trailing obviously six point favorite would obviously mean they're supposed to be playing from ahead that was my take last week with golf and he threw a pick on the first drive, but then he only threw the ball like 20 more times the rest of the game. Like, in theory, it's the right play. Sometimes it just goes and you the call, wrong way. You called out Goff's uh, pickless streak there, too, I think, ahead of the game. And then, of course, what happens? Yeah, of course. So, the, yeah. The, the how, counter jinx that hit so often. Always, always. But, hey, we all hopefully cashed Ravens' money line on Sunday. They were oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I talked myself in before the game, before the Watson announcement. I, I took them... Minus two handedly, and then again right after, or excuse me, plus two and a half. Then after Watson was out, it was like four point shift for a rookie quarterback yeah. in his first start. I think I tweeted out it was like ha hammer minus two, hammer minus. Two. Yeah, I was I was surprised it never got to three. Honestly, that probably prevented me from putting more on it because I was like, wait a second, the sickos. What did the sickos know this time? Because if you follow the Ravens. Rookie quarterback, like it's just a, it's never gonna happen. It's just never. Should we lose to a rookie destroy. quarterback? Mitch Trubisky beat them, who they'll at probably home. play this week at home on a Jordan Howard like seventy yard touchdown run in overtime. Shout out to but Michael Campanero that, returned a punt in that game. Kenny Pickett but, beat them last year. Right. Okay. So I know that there had been one or two, but it's never like they light like up the Ravens. Six under right, in, in, like in the two thousand something like that. It's, it's crazy. And McDonald, the way he's scheming it up too, like that it's even more of a nightmare nowadays. So yeah, I, I was shocked that it was only two and a half. Now, I think they were giving the Browns defense credit. And the Browns defense sneakily probably played pretty well on Sunday. I mean, they were getting pressure. The Ravens just converted at an insane clip. Like they had four good drives and they scored four touchdowns, and one of them was from eight yards. So 
I get it. Were but unbelievable on third down in the red zone. Just spectacular. So um, I'm excited. We've got our, our episode dropping tomorrow of Punchline with uh, Kyle Hamilton. But I'm, I'm watching it back right now. And I was literally thinking about I'm watching the part that I need Jake to watch. Um, because I know you got your OBJ Marlin interaction on Sunday after the game, which you love. Marlon tells a story right at like the 15, 20 minute mark that is like, it'll just blow your mind. It's not a good story. It is just the most Marlon Humphrey story about him in Istanbul getting baklava with some private driver that he found that was driving Uber. It is quintessential Marlon Humphrey. I am so excited for you to hear it. Um, and, and Kyle's awesome too. <laughs> I'm going to tune into that. I've had the take for a while that Marlon was, uh, and they're, they're good friends now, obviously, but I, I had the take that Marlon was kind of threatened by Kyle as like the, the good looking, like the tall dude who's <laughs> going to come into the secondary and kind of take Marlon shine a little bit. So that's why he was picking on him so much, kind of like a, uh, a big little situation there, a little bit of hazing going on. So I like that. Out. I would, I yeah. wish I had known that I, w- I would have poked at it more. Instead, we just asked Kyle if Marlon's his most annoying teammate, which he obviously assured that was the case. But Odell on Sunday being like, yeah, to all five people tuned in right now was just was so good. I was, uh, I was at a music festival this past weekend and I woke up, Spencer sent me that and I like woke up to it and I was in a hazy state. So I was like, is this like, is this even real? Like this is cr- like those two interacting. It's just, it's, it's sending me right now. So <laughs> Oh, yeah, that brings me so much joy. The one thing I t- diddled with, we'll we'll leave it on that. Go check out Punchline. Go check out Snapback Sports on Snapchat. Jack, we appreciate you. I twiddled my thumbs. The, this is my parlay for tomorrow that I do like. Brian Robinson, this is on Fanatics. Brian Robinson to get 50-plus rushing yards. Justin Fields to get 50-plus rushing yards. Sam Howe to throw 200 pass yards, plus 320. I had that on Fanatics, which I, I like Fanatics, that. I've been juicing because they're, they're taking a, a little vig. Their, their lines are better. They have some pretty rudimentary options. The alt spread stuff you can do. They just do 25-yard increments. And I think it uh, the, the the VIG is not there in these alt spreads and stuff. They're little. They're probably trying to gain people. Plus, you also get back like the little fan cash. Yeah. You can just convert into bonus bets. You get money back for bonus bets way bigger than any other sports book, essentially. They're like, oh, it's fan cash. You just click convert to bonus bets. So I love that. Uh, free fanatics plug. That'll be the last one. We'll 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 have to arrange something with fanatics. But Jack, appreciate you. Any last thoughts? Anything else? Thursday night. Tell the good people uh, how they can support you. Yeah, hopefully see you guys out there Thursday night. Anyone listening, if you're sicko and you like consuming all DMV content, come out to Commandy's Bears. And uh, hey, could be a big weekend in Baltimore. Let's let's sweep the weekend. Obviously, Orioles are are at the forefront right now. But if the Ravens win, they would have three AFC North road wins in the first five weeks. I don't. I would go as far as say that's probably never happened before. Like, who even made this schedule? There's no way that's it's been a, scheduled that way before. Brutal. Yeah, like, I like. I'm just realizing it. Fortunately, all those teams are kind of down bad, so it doesn't feel as grueling. But like, if we caught them like good three AFC North teams on the road. That's like the most ridiculous schedule I've ever heard. And they've they arranged the divisional there. schedules so that it, from what I understand, it's mostly beginning of the year. And then obviously the last couple of years, yeah. it's been like yeah. week 15, 16 and 18, you'll play divisional opponents. I, I feel like that is a good strategy to maximize viewership for some of those games. Cause the rivalry it is, is all- but but there's no way anyone else is playing like three on the road. But hey, you know what it means at the end of the season, you get all three at home. So I guess we'll take that because we're gonna have a crazy prime time stretch. So whatever. It is what it is. Ravens, let's go to four and one. And the Orioles. We are, can't, you, we can't, you, are you going to a Orioles game, Jack? I'm gonna oh yeah. What when are you going? Saturday? I'm going or Sunday? Sunday. I have a wedding on Saturday. I'm going on Sunday. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be this will be the first Ravens game I ever I'm not like I'm missing the Ravens game for the first time ever. Probably. Yeah. What uh, do, do we have suspicion on what time the game is going to be Sunday? I think four. I'm going to be completely wrong. I think four twenty five is like the best guess. Okay. But I have that, a feeling that like because it can be that it won't be. There actually because, might, be, right. there might be Sunday night baseball. I'll, I'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Well, the only reason I say that is because 
the Ravens leave for London on Monday morning. So I'm trying to figure out when to film with Marlon. And we're trying to do after the game Sunday night when they're back from Pittsburgh. So in a perfect world, Ravens at one. I can go to the Orioles game and then swing over and record when they get back from Pittsburgh. So we're all rooting for a 425. If I make it out, I'll I'll hit you up. Perfect. So I see I see Sunday, October 8th, ALDS game two, Orioles versus TBD, Astros versus TBD. That makes me think it's slotted, but I don't know what the times are. We'll we'll figure all of it out. But okay, all right, sounds good. All right, appreciate you, Jack. Thank, Thank you so much, my friend. That was that was settling up with the settle man, and we'll uh, we'll see you with a riveting review of Dan Snyder's beautiful ballpark he's built and left to Josh Harris, the house that Dan built. <laughs>